We're going to talk about an update on all things PPE or PPP, excuse me, and the EIDL. Um, today with us, we have Nadia Beatty from James Moore and Company, and she will start uh, with you guys in just a second. As a reminder, if you do have a question, please use the question and answer portal. Um, please try not to use the chat. We will get to the Q&A at the end of the presentation. We should have about 45 minutes of content with um, about 15 minutes left over um, for question and answers. If we do not get to the Q&A or if there are some that are left over, we will make sure to get with you directly and have those questions answered. We are recording today's session and following, uh, following the session, we will send this out to everyone who attended along with the slides. We will also have this on the Chamber's website um, where it will be archived where you can access it at any time. Um, so with that, uh, I introduce to you Nadia. Thank you for joining us today and I will turn it over to you. Awesome, Dana, thanks. Um, we're going to start this presentation by kind of reviewing the history of um, both programs and, and where we kind of stand today. So the history of the program, believe it or not, um, the CARES Act was passed only about four short weeks ago. Um, as a practitioner, and I know many practitioners feel the same way, some days it really feels like an eternity. It's hard to believe that it was four short weeks ago. So on March the 27th, the CARE Act was signed into law. On April the 3rd, the Payroll Protection Program opened for applications. Just a little over a week after that date, April the 10th, we were notified that all funds were expended um, before many people even got their applications in processed or approved. April the 10th was also the date that Schedule C's and sole proprietors were eligible to apply but never got the chance because the program ran out of money. But Monday, uh, or April the 24th, the second phase of the PPP program was funded with an additional $310 billion in funds. And on Monday of this week, the 27th, the SBA began processing applications again. At that time, there were still over 800,000 pending applications in process or in the queue. So all indications are that the second round of funding will not last long. There has been some talk of Congress refunding the program for a third time, but this is not guaranteed. As we're all aware from the beginning, there's been many issues with the program. Um, this has been an unprecedented program that was put out in record time, so we should have all anticipated issues. The banks during this time were just flooded with applications. Um, the SBA and the Treasury Department have really been vague or slow in issuing guidance, or if they have issued guidance, it's been after the fact and there was nothing really we could do to react to that. Um, we've all heard the stories recently of the publicly traded companies who received funding um, and then are turning around and uh, returning those funds. Um, but all in all, the program has been positive. It has provided funds for many small businesses who are struggling to retain empl employees and just provided a little bit of hope to those businesses. The other part of this program was the EIDL loan or the Economic Injury Disaster Loan. Um, this program was also administered by the SBA, but directly through the SBA, not through the banks. Um, and this loan program also ran out of money close to that April the 10th deadline, the same as the PPP. Additional money was authorized by Congress in the amount of about $60 billion, but the SBA currently is not taking any new applications. Um, the newly appropriated funds will be exhausted by previous applicants that already had their applications in. And at this time, there is no indication if that will be refunded or not. So I would recommend that if you have not applied for the PPP loan, um, there is still time. We would encourage you to file sooner rather than later because many banks are um, no longer um, taking applications, but some are. And then there's also several online vendors who've started processing applications. So um, hurry and get your application in um, if you haven't done so already. 
So for those of you who have received loans or will be receiving those loans soon, we will move into kind of what the loan forgiveness calculation is. Um, I will start by saying that there are still a lot of questions surrounding the loan forgiveness calculations. We are waiting on additional guidance from the SBA and Treasury Department, which you're going to hear over and over again in this presentation. But we can share what we currently know, give you a little bit of guidance, um, and let you know what we're unsure about or those portions of the calculations that we're you know, still unsure about. I would recommend that any recipient of PPP loans stay up to date on any new guidance issued and not rely on old information or maybe what you heard are the rules. Um, these rules are changing. We expect that once we issue guidance that some of that guidance will be different than what we assumed. Um, and so just kind of stay up to, gate, up to date on um, all things PPP loan forgiveness related. So what we'll do now is we'll kind of get into the basics of the PPP loan forgiveness calculation. And we'll just kind of review some um, definitions and um, what the general rules look like. So the basics of PPP loan forgiveness. So loan proceeds should be used for eligible costs. And we'll kind of review what those eligible costs are in a moment. Um, loan proceeds used for unauthorized purposes are not eligible for loan forgiveness. A PPP um, loans can qualify for forgiveness in whole or, par whole or part um, for eligible costs incurred in payments made during the covered period. The covered period starts eight weeks after the loan is dispersed, and we'll talk about this a little bit more, but there have been a lot of questions as to when does the covered period start, and that is when the funds are deposited into your bank account. Forgiveness will be reduced for any employee cuts or reduction in wages, but there is a relief provision available, and we'll discuss that. Um, and then the great part of this program is that the loan forgiveness is excluded from gross income, and this includes accrued interest up to that date. So under normal circumstances, um, any type of loan forgiveness income might have to be included in gross income, but under the PPP, um, it will not be. So now we're going to kind of go into the eligible, allowable uses of the PPP loan. And these are what you can spend the proceeds on. Um, payroll cost, of course, that's the whole purpose of the program. Um, payroll protection. Costs related to the continuation of group health benefits during paid sick, medical, or family leave and insurance premiums. Employee salaries, commissions, or similar compensation. Payments of interest on any mortgage obligation, um, which shall not include prepayment of or payments of principal on a mortgage obligation. And this is important, and we're going to kind of come back and look at this too, um, determining what amount of the interest is includable in the forgiveness calculation. And then there's been a lot of question on prepayments of expenses. And this is a small indication of maybe what that answer will be, but again, we'll just have to to wait on additional guidance. Rent, um, utilities, and we'll expand on the utilities definition, and then interest on any other debt obligations that were incurred before the covered period. And we'll kind of talk about the differences um, between this interest and the interest on mortgage obligations. Um, one is an allowable use of the loan, but is not included in the forgiveness calculation. So payroll, CARES Act defines payroll as the following, and this is really important um, to know this definition and what should be included in payroll costs, salaries, wages, commissions, or other similar compensation, payment of cash, tips, or equivalents, um, payment for vacation, parental, family, medical, or sick leave, allowance for dismissal of, or separation, payments required for the provision of group health care benefits, including insurance premiums, payment of any retirement benefits, or the payment of state and local um, tax assessed on the compensation of employees. And as you went through the application process, or if you're going through the application process, you should be somewhat familiar with this definition. 
but it will play into the loan forgiveness calculation also. So just as important to know what is included in payroll, we also need to know what's not included in payroll. And this is, these are questions that we are commonly getting from clients, um, but this is directly stated in the CARES Act also. So payroll does not include compensation um, in excess of $100,000 per person. It does not include payroll processing cost, um, employee portion of FICA, um, the employee Ye portion of FICA is included, but the employer portion of FICA is not included. Compensation of an employee whose principal place of residence is outside the U.S. Qualified sick leave wages for any credit allowed under the Families First Act. Um, payments to independent contractors and workers' compensation. So utilities. Um, utilities are allowable costs, and utilities include electric, gas, water, transportation, fuel costs for business vehicles. But I just wanna caution you that we are still waiting for guidance on this. Um, fuel costs for business vehicle was included um, in one of the IFRNs where they were explaining what can be included for a Schedule C. And so we're trying, we're waiting to determine if that will be um, applied to all businesses or still just Schedule Cs. Telephone expenses and then um, internet access. So go back and review these, make sure you understand what your allowable costs are, what amounts um, or the definition of each category, because you'll have to gather all of this information to start your um, forgiveness calculation. So now that we know what the basics are and what the allowable expenses are, we're gonna break it down into a four-step process. Um, and we're also gonna do a simple example after we explain the four steps to kind of show the theory and the calculation behind each step. So even if you don't understand it, maybe as we're going through the slide, hopefully the example will um, clarify some of these concepts for you. So step one, we have to calculate the amount eligible for loan forgiveness, okay? And so we're gonna start with the first step. 75% or more of the loan proceeds must be used for payroll cost. And we're gonna stop there for just a minute and explain the unknowns regarding this. Um, there are really two interpretations of this rule, and we're gonna to have to wait for guidance to determine which one is the correct one to use. So the first interpretation is that 75% of your total loan proceeds must be utilized for payroll expenses. And so an example of that is if you received a loan of $100,000, you would be required to expend 75% of that loan on payroll cost. The second interpretation is that the 75% is only on the eligible loan forgiveness amount. And we'll see that in our example, but this has caused a lot of confusion. Um, we don't have great answers on this at this point in time, but we just kind of want to make you aware of the two definitions of that first step. Um, so we are advising clients or we're cautioning clients to utilize as much of the loan as possible for loan forgiveness. So if we receive clarification two or three weeks down the road, um, our clients won't be in a jam based on that first definition. So the second part of this is not more than 25% of the loan forgiveness amount may be attributable to non-payroll costs, and that's rent, utilities, interest on mortgage, and we'll see that in our example in just a moment too. It must be used over the eight week covered period after the origination of the loan. And the SBA did clarify this and state that that is when you receive the proceeds. Um, the AICPA has recently issued some recommendations to the Treasury and the SBA. And one of those recommendations is that um, the definition of this eight week period, not to make it when the loan proceeds are received, but maybe when um, businesses are allowed to open back up. But again, um, those are not the rules. The rules, as they state currently, um, is that the eight-week covered period begins when the loan, when you receive the loan proceeds. And we have to go back to kind of what the intent of the Payroll Protection Act is, and that's to provide payroll currently. Um, so I'm not sure if that definition will change or not. 
And then the fourth step is that the $10,000 idle advance will be deducted from the loan forgiveness amount on the PPP loan. So that will decrease your amount eligible for loan forgiveness on the PPP because you'll receive loan forgiveness um, on that idle advance. So that's step one, the amount eligible for um, loan forgiveness. All right, step two is the full-time equivalent reduction. Borrowers must maintain headcount as loan forgiveness will be reduced if a business decreases its FTE employee headcount. So this is not an all or nothing calculation. This will just result in a percentage of the loan um, to be forgiven. So we'll start by calculating the average FTE employee headcount during the eight week covered period. So once you get your loan um, proceeds, that starts your eight week period and you'll have to determine your average FTE employee headcount for that eight weeks. And the second step is to calculate the FTE of two prior periods. So we'll use February of 2019 to June 30th of 2019, or you can use January and February of 2020. And then you'll calculate the percentages of FTEs retained by using the most advantageous period in step two. And we'll, we'll see this in the example, but pretty much you get to choose which one gives you um, the better result in loan forgiveness. And so you'll take that percentage and that's multiplied by the loan proceeds spent on the qualified expenses to determine the amount um, that's eligible forgiveness. So, and we'll look at this again in more detail. So one thing to note is that the calculation is based on average FTE count, not specific employees. That's a question that we've gotten a lot. Um, so during the second step and during your eight week covered period, or even if you haven't been given your loan yet, you wanna go through the exercise of calculating your FTE so that you'll know what they are for each period, have the documentation um, ready and available for um, your calculation. And so um, the next slide is FTE calculation. What are FTEs? How is the SBA defining FTEs? And we don't have a great answer on this. Um, the SBA on Sunday did issue a fact on it, but they didn't go as far as defining what that calculation would be. Um, they have told us to use the full-time equivalent employee to determine the loan forgiveness, but again, we kind of still need guidance on that specific calculation. Okay, so some of the questions surrounding the FTE is how should FTE employees be counted? Um, is the FTE employee count based on the number of hours worked for a given employee, or is it just one FTE for one employee, regardless of whether they're full or part-time, or if you have two part-time employees that work 20 hours a week, does that count as one full FTE? Um, and that's what we're waiting on guidance for. So we're gonna do the best that we can until then. All right, step three is salary reduction. So this is um, the one step that there are a lot of unknowns um, regarding this portion of the calculation. And so we'll kind of give you what the rules are and, and discuss what the unknowns are for this step. So you reduce the forgiveness for any individual who had a decrease in salaries and wages by more than 25%. And this does not include employees who make more than $100,000 per year. And so to calculate this step, you'll get a list of wages for each employee or employee role, and we'll talk about that employee role for the covered period. You compare to the most recent full quarter payroll prior to that covered period. So if your loan started today, you would compare it to the first quarter payroll for 2020. And then so for those wages reduced by more than 25%, the amount in excess is deducted from the forgiveness amount. Not as clear as mud, I know, um, but we'll kind of go through that. But before we kind of go through the example, we want to talk about um, the vagueness of this rule. We need guidance to address several issues that the borrowers and banks will face when calculating the 25% reduction. 
because remember that banks are the ones that will help you go through the forgiveness calculation and submit that. So banks will have to be up to date on these rules also. So as far as the salary reductions go, do we compare specific employees or roles? There's some indication that it might be roles. Um, so for example, a role would be if you owned a restaurant, all of your servers, or um, if you had uh, a business that had a salesperson who um, um, you know, worked off commission, it would be all of your sales uh, employees but we're not sure. Currently, it does um, indicate maybe that it's specific employees, but that causes issues because what if you furloughed or laid off employees? What if they can't or won't return? Um, how do you do an employee calculation based on each employee when um, there's you know, really gonna be reductions of salaries of more than 25%? Um, some other questions have been, you know, how should bonuses, commissions, or other forms of compensation be considered in this calculation because they're not, you know, maybe your normal um, base salary amounts. Um, and then the last one is that the periods being compared are not comparable based on the number of weeks being computed. As the calculation requires the comparison of an eight-week period during your covered period to a 13-week period for your payroll period. Most people agree that this will probably be some sort of an average weekly payroll calculation. Um, but again, we'll just need some additional guidance from the SBA and Treasury. And then the last step before we get into our example is restoration. Um, there is a safe harbor re for rehires. Borrowers can reduce or eliminate the reduction of loan forgiveness calculated in step two or three. In step two or three with the FTE and the reduction of wages calculation um, if, if it's eliminated by June the 30th, 2020. And so ultimately, if you rehire everyone or um, bring everybody's salaries up to the point um, of the first quarter by June the 30th, you um, will not have your loan reduced for those um, calculations. So the purpose for the purpose of this test, the number of FTE employees on or before the June 30th, 2020 is compared to the number of FTE employees on February the 15th, 2020. But again, we need additional guidance from the SBA. Is this an all or nothing test? If you don't bring it up, um, do you get you know, zero reduction? Um, or if you bring it up you know, a percentage of the way, do you get that percentage of the loan forgiven or um, restored? So again, a lot of guidance on here. So now we'll kind of go into a simple example and um, show the steps, the first, the four steps that we just went through. Okay. So in our example, it's a local restaurant. Um, this local restaurant applied for a loan of $100,000. The loan was funded on May the 1st, so that starts our covered period. And this local restaurant had the following expenses during the eight week period. They had payroll cost of 80,000, rent of 10,000, utilities of 5,000, and interest of 2,000. So their total eligible loan forgiveness, the amount that they spent on eligible cost was $97,000. Um, they did not utilize or spent their 100,000 on non-eligible expenses um, in the amount of about $3,000. So just kind of want to make that distinction that um, the total eligible loan forgiveness is based on your eligible cost um, even the, if you spend a portion of it on non-eligible costs, um, you kind of go through the calculation this way. So the average FTE during our covered period in our example was 52. They had 52 employees over the next eight weeks. The average FTE from January and February was 55, and then the average FTE in 2019 during the time period was 54. So these are kind of our basic facts of our example. All right, so step one, um, the total amount eligible forgiveness and did we spend a percentage of the funds on um, the correct expenses? So did we spend more than 75% of the loan on payroll? Um, and so remember that there's two um, interpretations of this rule currently. The percent of payroll based on the total loan, and so our total payroll was $80,000 and our total loan was 100,000, so we spent 80%. 
the percent of payroll based on eligible loan forgiveness. And you'll remember back um, in our facts, we'll go back, this was our total eligible loan forgiveness, the amount that we spent on eligible cost of 97,000. So um, the second interpretation is that it's based on the 97,000. So we have 80,000 divided by the 97,000 to get to 82.5%. Well, in our example, we kept it um, pretty simple to kind of show the concept behind how to calculate that. But in specific business examples, this could make a huge difference um, if you met that 75% criterion. So just kind of be aware of that, that there's a different thoughts on how to calculate that. And again, we'll wait for the SBA to give us some guidance. The second step in this is was more than 25% of the utilized proceeds or the amount eligible for forgiveness attributable to non-payroll cost. And so in our example, we had $17,000 of eligible non-payroll cost. And we'll take that amount and divide it by the 97,000, which was the amount eligible for forgiveness. And so we had 17.525%. So we met that $25,000 or 25% threshold. Um, so our total amount eligible when we went through the steps for loan forgiveness was $97,000. So that's step one. So now we'll move on to the FTE reduction and show you what this looks like. So we had this stated in our facts that our FTE during our covered period was 52, and then our FTE during 2020 and then 2019 periods was 55 and 54. And so what we do is we calculate what that percentage is based on each of those periods compared to the covered period. So for the first one, we got 94.5, and the second one, we got 96.6. We are gonna choose the highest. Um, and in this case, we're going to choose the 96.3. And we take the total amount eligible forgiveness at $97,000, um, and we multiply it times the 96.3. And that is our new eligible um, forgiveness amount. And so because we did not maintain FTEs compared to those prior periods, our loan forgiveness is reduced by $35.89. Okay, so step three is that confusing step of salary reduction. And I just wanna clarify again that the first quarter of 2020 is a 13 week period, um, but we're comparing it to a covered eight week period. In my example, I didn't go through and calculate the average weekly salary. I just really wanted to show you the concept of the salary reduction and what that looked like. So, um, this is a restaurant, and as a restaurant, um, we're probably going to still maintain our managers. So during the first quarter of 2020, we paid our manager $30,000, and during the covered eight-week period, we paid them $32,750. Our servers, our doors aren't open. We're just doing takeout. We've let most of our servers go, maybe. Um, there's a reduction in salary of about 50% for our servers. So already there, we know we have an issue because their salary was reduced um, by more than 75%. The next part is the cooks. Um, the cooks were paid $30,000 in 2020, um, but during the eight week covered period, they were only paid 22,250. And so we reduced them by 25%, but not more, um, not more than 75% reduction in their total salary. So the part to remember that this reduction is in excess of the 25%. So even though our servers were reduced by 25,000, we're only gonna take the portion in excess of the 75%, so that's the 12,500. So then we come down to the reduction in our loan forgiveness, and we're gonna take the amount that was reduced by the FTE reduction, the 93,000, and then we're gonna reduce it further by the salary reduction of the 12,500. So now our total amount eligible for forgiveness is the 80,911. Um, and again, just remember that we're kind of making some assumptions um, in this step in the example, the salary reduction, because we just kind of wanted to keep it on a simple basis. All right, and then step four, restoration step by June the 30th. Um, if you restore your FTE and payroll by June the 30th, you can elim eliminate your reduction. 
So in our example, um, our FTEs remain the same as of June the 30th. The restaurant really wasn't up and going, you know, completely to 100%, um, and our FTEs didn't change. But our restoration of salaries increased. We increased them, you know, 100% to the first quarter payroll. So the concept in the restoration is that our original forgiveness amount was the 80,000, that we add back that restoration of the salary reduction because we're back up to 100% um, of that amount. And so then our new loan forgiveness on June the 30th is the 93411. And again, a lot of questions um, surrounding this restoration, you know, is it all or nothing? Um, or can you, if we only would have restored our salaries back to 90% of the level, you know, would we get a portion of the restoration? Um, and again, we just don't have any guidance, but these are the things that we just need to start thinking about in the calculation. So again, this was a very simple example just to kind of um, demonstrate the concepts of the four steps that you have to go through in calculating the loan forgiveness amount. So how do I apply for loan forgiveness? So after the eight week period uh, or covered period following the loan origination date, borrowers have 90 days to submit loan forgiveness documentation to the lender. Um, the lender then has 60 days to make a decision on loan forgiveness. And so this is part of the application process that all of this will have to be submitted to the bank again. Um, and so one of the questions we get is what documentation do I need to keep? Um, what do I need to submit? Um, and we don't have an answer for you. I can tell you that each bank required a different set of records when you applied for the PPP loan. I expect that to be the same for the forgiveness calculation. Each bank will have specific documentation that they will want or request, and it's gonna be different across the board. So just some advice in the meantime, um, maintain really good records of the loan proceeds and um, expenditures that you had during the covered period. Uh, a lot, some banks are, are, there's a recommendation of maybe keeping a separate bank account. It's not required, uh, it may be good practice, but just really keeping good documentation. Um, documentation to verify the use of funds on eligible expenses, canceled check, GL detail, um, bank statements will probably be requested for this. Documentation verifying employees on payroll and their pay rates. This will probably be provided by your payroll provider. Um, documentation to verify FTEs, going through the calculation, um, you know, how many employees did we have during certain periods? How many hours did they work? How do we calculate this FTE and proof of that? Um, documentation on covered costs, proof of payments, utility bills, um, interest statements for mortgage payments, whatever they may be. And then any additional documents as requested or that we can kind of guess that might be requested. Um, so we're going to get into some common questions that we've received regarding um, the forgiveness calculation. Let's see. Oh, this is another side. Borrowers deferring the employer's portion of Social Security taxes under the CARE Act should be aware that they are no longer eligible to defer these taxes um, once they receive a decision on loan forgiveness from the lender. That doesn't mean that you have to pay those taxes. Um, you can still defer the taxes prior to that period, but after you receive a decision on loan forgiveness, you no longer qualify for this. Okay. So one of the mis or areas that we need a ton of clarification on is does the payroll cost include cost incurred or cash payments for payroll? So an example to kind of show you what the difference is, is the loan is funded on April the 30th and payroll is paid on May the 1st for the previous two weeks of payroll. Does the entire payroll paid on May the 1st qualify or only the portion that was incurred from the date of the loan? And so the answer to this is we need additional guidance. Um, the payment made statement and the legislation implies a cash basis of accounting. However, the cost incurred implies an accrual basis of accounting and huge differences between those. 
some of the questions surrounding this is, does a cost need to be both incurred and paid during the covered period? Um, or can such costs be incurred during the period or paid afterwards? Um, can a cost incurred um, prior to the covered period, such as you know, payroll for the previous two weeks, be included in your, um, your, your covered cost during that time period? And, and we just don't know. And this is probably the area that we're getting the most questions on um, and not a lot of answers. And, and until the Treasury can provide additional guidance, um, we're just asking clients to kind of calculate it both ways and keep an eye on it at this point in time. So not the answer everybody wanted, but the only answer we have at this time. Another common question, can we, paid can we pay accrued bonuses from earlier periods or can we pre-fund retirement? Um, again, this is an area that we'll need additional guidance on. Based on the definition of payroll costs, we know that bonuses and retirements can be included, but does that incurred statement prohibit us from paying bonus or retirement earned in a different period during the covered period? And if you'll remember um, back in one of the earlier slides, there was a statement about the prepayment of mortgage interest or prepayment of um, mortgage payments. And the legislation stated that that could not be included. So we're not sure if that's an indication that all prepayments won't be included. We'll just have to, again, wait for that additional guidance. Can I delay receipt of the money so that the clock will start later? Another common question we received. And the answer is no, that this is not allowed. Banks are required to disperse all proceeds 10 days after approval. So that's the only delay in receiving the money that you have. Um, you can talk to your bank and say, hey, can we wait until the last possible moment? But they are under strict requirements that those proceeds be dispersed 10 days after approval. And if you think about the intent of the program, again, the intent of the program is to pay for payroll for the next eight weeks. So they don't want people postponing that. Okay. How do independent contractors and sole proprietors calculate their loan forgiveness? Um, so loan, when you applied for the um, PPP loans, if you're an independent contractor or sole proprietor, you took your schedule, 2019 Schedule C, regardless of whether it was filed or not, submitted that to the bank. And the loan was based on um, 12 months. So you took that net profit divided by 12 months and then multiplied it times 2.5 and that was your loan for amount. Unless you had employees and then you would add on the amount um, in the calculation for your employees. The problem is, is that the forgiveness, and we have gotten some guidance on this, is based on eight weeks out of 52 weeks. So the max of forgiveness amount is $15,385 for Schedule C or self sole proprietors, self-employed individuals. Um, so we're cautioning Schedule C filers that, hey, there's a good chance, unless you have other eligible expenses, that the whole portion, 100% portion of your loan will not be forgiven just because of the differences in the calculation. Um, how the loan was calculated versus how the forgiveness is calculated. So just kind of be aware of that. Um, Schedule C's can also um, submit other covered expenses like your utility payments, um, rent, leases. Um, there is a section in there that states gas for business vehicles um, per Schedule C. But just again, um, for the 2019 Schedule C, there's a really good potential that 100% of that will not be forgiven. And so the other question that we get with independent contractors and sole proprietors is, well, what am I going to have to submit to get it forgiven? Pretty much the same thing that you submitted to get the loan in the first place will be that 2019 Schedule C. Okay, so what happens if I don't get 100% of my loan forgiven? Well, payments are deferred for a, per of a period of not less than six months, including payments of principal interest fees and not more than one year. So you get a deferral of payments. Um, after that, it converts into a note of interest rate of 1% in a two-year term. 
So pretty good rate on in terms on that loan. Okay, so advice. Um, have a plan. Um, have a plan A, have a plan B, have a plan C, have a plan D. Um, we are advising clients to really calculate their loan forgiveness on multiple scenarios based on the rules that we know now, the unknowns, um, really be fluid in changing that calculation. And then determining kind of what your goals are related to the PPP. Are you wanting to maximize forgiveness of 100%? Are you like, you know what, I don't really care about that. I just really want to keep the business open or retain my workforce. And people are approaching it from different standpoints. So kind of figure out what your goals are. Um, you know, create a scenario that helps you reach those goals, develop a budget for the next covered eight week period, and, and just be fluid as we um, obtain more guidance from the SBA. So keep good records, um, communicate with your bank regarding support needed for loan forgiveness. I'm sure all of us will get emails from our banks and they currently probably don't know much more than we do, um, but hopefully they will be receiving guidance. All of us will be receiving guidance shortly. Keep up to date on any changes to the SBA program or clarifications um, issued. Okay, so plan B. So that was just really a quick synopsis of the loan forgiveness portion. Um, plan B, I didn't get the PPP or the idle loan, now what? Um, and this is a question that we're getting, or the question is, it's not going to be enough. The PPP isn't going to be enough for me to, you know, maintain operations for the next eight weeks. Work with somebody and review your financial situation. This could be your CPA, this could be a bank, this could be another business owner, um, your financial advisor, whoever it is. Review your financial situation model out different scenarios or options. Like I said, you want that plan B, C, D, and E, um, and be prepared to adapt because we don't know what programs will be released during this time period. Okay, other liquidity and cash options, and we're gonna kind of go through these um, quickly. But the first one is generating cash through tax law changes. And most people are probably asking, really, I can get you know, cash back from tax law changes? But the answer is potentially you can. Um, the CARES Act included several changes that could help generate cash now, depending on your facts and circumstances. And that was why these changes were instituted as they were trying to get money back to businesses as quickly as possible. So net operating loss carry back is um, the first change. Under the Tax Cut and Jobs Act, it, limit, it um, limited the use of net operating losses. We couldn't carry them back. We had to carry them forward. They were limited when we carried them forward. Well, now we can carry those losses back um, from 2018 to 2020. You can carry those losses back for five years. So if you had a loss in your business in 2018, um, talk to your tax advisor um, if it makes sense for you to carry those losses back and get a refund for um, previous period taxes paid. Same for 2019 and then 2020, which really doesn't help us now, but we know that a lot of businesses are going to have losses in 2020 and that you're able to carry those losses back and get a tax refund for previous periods. Bonus depreciation for qualified improvement. This was a TCJA glitch, it's called the retail glitch. And pretty much it allows you to go back um, retroactive to 2018 and amend your returns and take 100% bonus depreciation for qualified improvements. So if you've had improvements to a um, non-residential property, um, talk to your tax advisor and see if it makes sense for you to go back and amend or file a 3115 to, to to take those expenses. It could reduce your taxes now, it could reduce an, or increase an NOL or create an NOL so that you can get a refund. Um, and this also applies if you are a tenant and have like tenant improvements that you had to pay for potentially. Um, corporate quick, quick refund is another way. Um, if a corporate fiscal year ended, but the original due date has not passed. So for example, um, a corporation that has like a March 30th, 2020 year end, 
Um, they're like, hey, we're not going to owe as much tax as we thought. We want a refund right now of estimated taxes that we paid. You can apply for that. Um, distributions from retirement funds had several questions on this. So taxpayers impacted by the coronavirus are eligible to take up to $100,000 in distributions from their retirement plan in 2020, penalty free. Um, the distributions are still taxable income, but the income can actually be recognized over a three year period. So you get to maintain more cash in your pocket. And then if you have, you have the opportunity to repay the amounts back to the retirement plan within three years of the distribution um, and have the distribution be treated as a tax-free rollover. So it won't be taxable income to you. And then the um, number two, we're not gonna go into a ton of detail on these, but gener generating cash through payroll tax credits, especially if you haven't received a PPP loan um, really talk to your payroll provider about the employee retention credit, the payroll tax deferral, where you can defer, you know, the employer, an employee portion of the payroll taxes, and then the employee paid leave credit. And then number three is really um, generating cash through operational changes of your business. Um, if you have loans, talk to your bank. There's a ton of programs out there or deferrals that they're working with clients on. Um, if you have significant APs, talk to your vendors. Say, hey, I'm not able to pay this or I can only pay a portion of this. Um, we have to remember that some of those vendors are small businesses themselves. So just open those lines of communication. Um, really analyze every aspect of your business. And I know most people are doing that, but determine what's necessary, what's not. Think outside the box. Um, communicate with your employees. They might have ideas that you haven't thought about. So have that team meeting, um, open up that communication and, and see what ideas they can generate or just communicate to them, you know, the, the facts and the reality and the situation of the business. And then traditional lending options. Um, the one thing through this whole PPP program is that small banks have shined. And I think everybody would agree to that. But um, traditional lending is an option. Um, lending is getting tougher. There's no doubt about it in the current economic environment. But reach out to your local bank and see what options are out there. Some of them have some really great programs and might be able to give you some advice and kind of help you through that. So that is pretty much the end of um, my presentation. And I guess we'll start on questions now, Dana. Absolutely. So um, there are about eight or 10 in the portal. Okay. I know we had some previously too. So, so uh, the first one says, we only have five employees, but it made us use our 2019 payroll when we were bigger. Mm -hmm. So our loan was 83,100, but our numbers at the end of the eight week period will only be about 40,000, so does not reach the 75%. percent mm -hmm. How will this work for us? Um, so the famous answer is we're gonna need additional guidance on this. Um, but the one thing that I would do is probably reach out to your bank and ask, impose the question to them and they probably won't know either. Um, there's been some talk of, and we've had other clients that are in this exact same situation um, not knowing how every step of the forgiveness was going to work, um, probably asked for more PPP loans than they should have, um, but we, we didn't know at that point in time. We just, we were a little bit in the dark. So reach out to your bank and say, hey, you know, I'm a little afraid um, that I'm not going to meet that 75% under whatever the definition um, you use. Ask them if it's possible maybe to return those proceeds to the bank before May the 7th. Um, I wish I could tell you that if the second interpretation of that 75% actually ends up being the correct one, that it's 75% of the amount that you used for eligible costs, costs, then you're okay because the rest of it will just convert into a loan. The problem that you're going to run into is that if it's 75% of the total loan proceeds, if that's the definition that they use. And I'm hoping that we're going to have clarification on this before May the 7th, 
because May the 7th is that deadline um, that the SBA and Treasury Department has given to like public companies to return funds without you know any questions asked. So I would say just to stay tuned to the updates and reach out to your bank and ask them what options are available. Okay, um, next one. When dispersing PPP funds, is there any guidance with regard to record keeping? Um. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Not a ton, um, but I would use a pretty common sense approach. Um, we know that probably the information that was asked during the application process, that information will be asked to be provided again, except for maybe like your W-2s, W-3s, which haven't been filed at this point, um, but some sort of maybe daily payroll journal, whatever that may be. Um, just keep really good documentation, um, use a common sense approach of what you think the bank will ask for if they're invoices, cancel checks, um, and then just kind of wait and see what the bank, what your individual bank actually requests. Um, what about workers' comp premium? That is not an eligible payroll cost. Um, so that cannot be included in the forgiveness calculation. Um, it could be, it, you, you can utilize the proceeds for non-eligible costs, but that's where it would not be included in the forgiveness calculation. If your PPP loan was approved for a specific amount and you did not include utilities into the calculation, can you go back and ask for additional? Um, the answer to that is no. So the way that the PPP loan was um, calculated, it was pretty much just based on your payroll and benefits. And then they used a factor of 2.5. And so ultimately they gave you 25% additional proceeds to cover those costs. Um, for some businesses that was enough and for others it, that 25% won't be enough. But the way that the program was designed for that initial calculation, um, you can't go back and ask, ask for additional proceeds. Um, how do we account for employees who left voluntarily after February and before proceeds were received, thereby reducing headcount? Yeah, so it's not only thereby reducing headcount, but it's the reduction in salaries calculation too. And I'm not sure. Common sense tells us that um, you know employees left. They they're on unemployment. They found um, new jobs. We're not going to potentially be able to bring those specific employees back. So I'm hoping that something, some guidance is given by the SBA when we talked about those employee roles versus individual employees. But we don't have an answer yet. I think it's really unfair to look at the calculation based on individual employees when some of those employees will not return, can't return, um, or on unemployment or found you know, new employment. So again, unfortunately, um, it's just waiting on, on guidance for that and hoping that common sense prevails in that guidance. Um, are you allowed to give raises during this eight week period? And if so, what percentage in your opinion? Um, it's interesting. So this is the creativity part of it, of trying to utilize as much of the proceeds as you can for payroll cost. There's nothing currently that states that you can't give a raise. Now remember, you do have that $100,000 cap. Um, you can only include payroll costs up to the $100,000 amount. Um, but this is a conversation that we're, you know, having with clients of do we give raises, do we give bonuses, what does that look like? Um, and so to answer your question, I think it will be fine, but again, we'll wait on guidance um, from the SBA um, to make that final determination. Okay. If loan payments kick in at six months, but it appears that between bank and SBA times to calculate forgiveness is seven months. I interpret that as I will have to start payments before possible forgiveness can be determined. 
<laughs> Isn't that a nightmare scenario? Um, so nine, so 90 days after, um, the covered period is when you have to submit your documentation. And then of course, 60 days after that, the banks, um, have 60 days to determine the forgiveness portion, um, that they submit to the SBA. So you're right. Six months time period might lapse. And then of course you would be re potentially required to start making that loan payment back. Um, the deferment can be up to a year, though, which is, I think, where um, that will be helpful, is that it's six months and up to one year. And so I have to believe that if you're in the process of applying for forgiveness, that they will not require payments to be made until that application is processed. So hang your hat on that six months to a year deferral definition. Okay. Uh, we have a couple more. We'll see if we can get through. Um, and... Uh, there is actually a question in the chat uh, that says, are company cell phones allowed? I'm not sure what that was in reference to or when it came through. Okay, that's probably based on the definition of um, utilities. Um, and under the definition of utilities, there's like internet access and phone. Um, we, I assume that cell phones will be included in that utility definition. Again, the SBA or the Treasury could come back and say, no, that's not, you know, an allowable cost. But from a common sense approach, not many people have, you know, landline phones any longer. And so um, I would assume that cell phones would be included in that utility definition. Um, I am an independent contractor. My PPP application was approved. Requested funds for payroll to replace my income. You said it may not be forgiven. Can I amend the application to say it will pay for utilities, mortgage, gas, and vehicle expense, et cetera? Mm -hmm. So again, that application can't be amended to include those ex specific expenses. Um, for an independent contractor, the loan amount will be based on your Schedule C, and they will take that Schedule C divided by 12 months and then multiply that by a factor of 2.5. Um, so ultimately you're getting 25% of your Schedule C income for um, other purposes, but to amend it and add those additional expenses directly, you won't be able to do that. Okay, two more. If your PPP loan was based on six employees and you hire another employee during this period, how does calculation change now? So um, it won't change the loan application or the proceeds that you received, but it will potentially um, increase your total payroll cost in the calculation. It will increase potentially your total FTE, so there won't be a reduction in your loan forgiveness for the FTE portion. Um, and then if they allow you to group employee roles, then it could have a benefit on the reduction of salary calculation. Um, so another employee um, would benefit the forgiveness calculation, but you can't go back and amend it and say, hey, I have more employees, I need more additional funds. Okay. I had heard that if you received the PPP loan, all employees had to work eight weeks for 40 hours. I also read where they may work as few as 75% time, which is more accurate? <laughs> Probably none of the above. <laughs> um, so I, I have not read any type of requirement that states they have to work for eight weeks at 40 hours a week. I think that goes against the FTE calculation. Um, I think you could still have part-time employees um, and not require them to work on a full-time basis. So you know, one of the interesting questions that we've received from other clients is, hey, I have employees, I'm paying them, but I don't have anything for them to do. And that's a difficult question to answer. Do you pay them just to sit home? You know, some of the advice that we've given is, you know, if there's online research, if there's some, you know, something that you've been putting on that you can get them to, putting off that you could get them to do, um, another great, um, a great item is to have them do um, volunteer work under the name of the company. Um, has really positive press for the company. 
um, makes them feel useful, um, and then, you know, contribute to the community in the same way. Well, Nadia, thank you. Um, that is all the questions that we have for today. Um, okay. Everyone who is still on the um, call can see um, the James Warren Company link here. Again, as a reminder, we will be exporting out this recording and um, getting the slides and sending that to you um, no later than tomorrow. Um, we just have to do a little bit of uh, uh, production on the video to get it out and get it uploaded to our YouTube channel but we will get that out within 24 hours. And we thank you all for attending with us. Um, please make sure to visit our chamber resources page at talchamber.com slash coronavirus, um, as well as our jobs now page and support local page. Um, thank you guys. We are in this together and hope that everybody is safe and healthy and we will see you all soon.